Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, thanks all for being here. So today, it's our great pleasure to have Michel Pin from NYU, who will be telling us about central limit theorems for the characteristic polynomial of general beta ensembles. Go ahead, Michel. Um, okay, thank you, uh, uh, Guillaume, for the, the invitation. Uh, so, okay, just to be sure, everyone is seeing my mouse here. Or not? Yeah, I can see it. Yes. Okay, okay, perfect. Okay, so yeah, the topic is uh, so uh, general beta ensembles, which are type uh, random matrix uh, model uh, uh, type of uh, on the real line. And uh, we look at the characteristic polynomial of such a, a matrix. And we take the logarithm. And uh, okay, it looks like that. And we try to understand uh, the asymptotic behavior of this uh, random function. Let's say. So it's a joint work with uh, Paul Bourgad and uh, Krishnan Modi, so a very local team. Uh, and the paper is not yet on uh, the archive, but uh, very soon. Okay. So let me start with uh, the, the, the definition of the model. So this is a so general beta ensembles, which are also called log gas uh, in uh, dimension one, uh, are a system of particles and particles on the real line. Uh, that's okay. So there are two two main uh, phenomena. First, the each particle. Uh, is affected by a confining potential V. And also there are logarithmic interactions between the particles. So the energy of a particle configuration is given by the sum of the potential taken uh, at each uh, position lambda k. And uh, this uh, so minus the log of the distance between two particles. So the, the interaction are repulsive. Okay. And then, uh, of course, we just take the Gibbs measure associated to this energy. So we pick a configuration at random proportionally to exponential minus beta, the Hamiltonian. So it can be written like that. You see that you have uh, the usual Vandermond uh, determinant to some, uh, some power, and then uh, the, the effect of the potential. OK, so just like this, it's not a random matrix model. Uh, but there are particular cases where the lambda i's are the eigenvalues of random matrix models. Uh, the most studied case is the one where v is quadratic and beta is 1, 2, or 4. Then you find uh, the classical uh, Gaussian matrices, so GOE, GUE, or GSC, which are just random matrices filled with IID Gaussian entries. Um, if you take a general V, but uh, these values of beta, uh, that's what, what are called the uh, classical invariant ensembles. Uh, and uh, finally, you can uh, take V, which is quadratic, but any beta. And these are the Gaussian beta ensembles. And um, this one, is, okay, it's not so clear that there are uh, random matrices, but actually there are. So it's a result by Dimitriou and Edelman that uh, there is a representation as a tree diagonal matrix. So a matrix where there are only entries on the diagonal and the two diagonal around with uh, uh, random entries. Okay. Um, so that's the model. Uh, okay, the first thing to know is that uh, if you pick particles according to this uh, Gibbs measure, then the empirical measure uh, will have a deterministic limit. This limit is a measure that we call the, the equilibrium measure, um, mu ek, and it's the minimizer of this quantity, which is just the limit of the, the energy, actually. It's a limiting energy. So it's uh, exactly what you, what you take when you take the limit in the Hamiltonian. Okay, so mu equilibrium is a measure defined as the minimizer of this quantity. And uh, okay, if V is nice, uh, uh, 
mu equilibrium will have a density that we denote by rho equilibrium, and it's compactly supported. So an example is for Gaussian beta ensemble, you find the semicircle distribution. So the, the equilibrium measure is the semicircle distribution. Should not be surprised because uh, this is the case of the classical case of GOE and GE. Okay, so what are our assumptions? Um, we, we assume that uh, indeed there, there is only one, uh, so everything looks like for G beta ensembles. So there is only, uh, the support is an interval from A, B. So a single interval. Um, and uh, V behaves as a square root close to the edge. So exactly as the semicircle distribution. Uh, so that, that, that's called to say that the potential is off critical. And uh, then we have some uh, uh, say technical assumptions. First, we need some regularity. We even assume that V is uh, analytic. And um, we need some control on the behavior of V and V prime at uh, infinity. Uh, okay, so that's it for, for the assumptions. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions on the model. That's, uh, what's the, the, the goal here? Um, so what we want to look at is uh, the characteristic polynomial. So more precisely, the logarithm of the characteristic polynomial. So for us, it's the sum over all particles of uh, the log of E minus uh, the position of the kth particle. So, okay, just uh, for me, the, this is a, uh, I extend the log on the, the negative uh, axis. And I say that, uh, okay, I, I actually I'm considering the, the complex log in this, uh, talk where I extend the log on the negative axis from above. So here, the log on the negative axis is equal to pi, i pi, sorry. So I look at this quantity, which is, uh, uh, which is a complex quantity. So there, there is the real part, which is the log of the sum of the log of the absolute value. This is really the log of the absolute value of the determinant. And there is the imaginary part, which is also uh, interesting because uh, actually it's the counting function of particles. So because the imaginary part of the logarithm on the real line, it's just uh, this indicator function. Uh, the imaginary part of the log characteristic polynomial counts, counts how many particles are larger than E. And, um, so our goal is to study the asymptotic behavior of uh, this quantity. So if you just look like this, uh, okay, it looks pretty deterministic. That's because uh, that's the law of large number. So you have to recenter by um, the result given by the law of large numbers. So which is n times the integral of this function against the equilibrium measure. Now, if you do that, you, you see an interesting uh, quantity. So you see that there are uh, fluctuations and that's the fluctu these fluctuations that we want to understand in this talk. Uh, so what are the motivations uh, for this? So the first motivation um, is just because the imaginary part is the, um, the counting function of particles if you get the fluctuations for the imaginary part of the log characteristic polynomial, you can deduce the, uh, the fluctuations for the positions of the, each particle around the position where you expect it to be. So that's the first motivation. And the other one is uh, related to the theory of uh, log correlated fields. So, uh, this is a, 
this is a field, so a field in, in, where indexed by the, the real line. And the real part and the imaginary part should behave as a asymptotically. So first they are Gaussian, so we expect a central limit theorem. And the correlation should be logarithmic. So this is what we expect. Um, the behavior, the, the expectation, the uh, covariance between the value of the field at x and the value of the field at y uh, behaves as minus the log of the, um, the absolute value of the distance, so the distance between x and y. Um, then there is this uh, saturation uh, term. So actually, if you forget this part, then uh, the log just blows up and uh, you see that the variance at one point would be infinite. Here actually the, the variance at any point is uh, uh, minus log, uh, is, is log n actually. So there is this saturation that when points are really close, then okay, you just, the, co the variance is, there is a saturation at level log. Okay, so log correlated fields, which satisfy this uh, property. So uh, there are many of them and, uh, and uh, okay, some of them are first uh, the Gaussian free field in dimension two. So if you want to get such a saturation effect, you need to take the continuous Gaussian free field uh, and regularize it, or you take the discrete Gaussian free field in uh, dimension two. Uh, the toy model for this class of models is the branching Brownian motion or the branching random walk. Um, there is the logarithm of the Riemann zeta function and also a cover times in uh, dimension two. Michel, can I ask one question? So yes. the X and E does have singularities when the E is equal to lambda case, right? So. Uh, yes. Okay. So, so like the plots you were showing, they were regularized, right? There was some sort of cutoff. Oh, uh, the, 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 okay. I see what you mean. Uh, let me go back to. So this one you mean? Yeah. So, okay, for the imaginary part, no, because uh, okay, there is no the reality anymore. And for the real part, uh, yes, actually. So the, for the, if you look at the top, there is no, it's just that it's, okay. It's a discretization of the set of negative two, two here. Uh, so of course I don't catch the, I, I don't catch each singularity, but actually you should have a, a line going to ne negative infinity at each particle, okay. many of them here, but not uh, on the top of course. So yes, you're, you're right. Okay, but these singularities don't affect the convergence to the Gaussian because you're looking at a particular point? Uh, yes, exactly. It's, uh, yeah, that's, you, you cannot be typically exactly at this point and so, this type of behavior, you, you don't see it. Exactly. Um, okay, so th th there is this whole class of fields and the goal is to, so among those fields, there are the characteristic polynomials of uh, random matrices. So for some, I, I will come back to this, but for many models, it has already been uh, proved that the uh, uh, log characteristic polynomial is a Log correlated field. And uh, okay, so our result is part of this framework. And uh, then, okay, the next step would be uh, to, to say that there are some uh, uh, common behaviors to the models in this, uh, in this family. So, first, there is the behavior of the maximum of the field, uh, which is supposed to be the same for all these models. And here we can say that. <laughs> Um, the fact that, uh, okay, uh, there are some uh, uh, some singularities in the, the real part of the log uh, matters actually. For the maximum, it doesn't matter, but you could not have the same result for the minimum, of course, because it would, it would always be minus infinity. So. And uh, the other type of results is uh, for these fields, you, you, if you exponentiate the, the field, uh, you consider this measure, which has a density exponential of the field uh, normalized by its expectation. Then you get a, 
a random measure. This is the one obtained for uh, quotient beta ensembles. Uh, and this measure converges to the Gaussian multiplicative case. Okay, so there, there are many, many papers uh, on this topic. Uh, I won't uh, uh, enter the, the details. I will comment a bit more on uh, the one related to random matrix theory later. Okay, but that's somehow the motivation to, for, for, for these results. Okay, questions? So, okay, um, let's talk about central limit theorems now. Uh, before taking the central limit theorem for um, uh, the log characteristic polynomial, uh, the first results are typically central limit theorems for what are called linear statistics. So a linear statistic is just a function, a sum over all particles of the function of the position of the particle. Uh, this, uh, linear statistic, the first order is given by the law of large numbers, of course. And if you center like this, you have a central limit theorem. And actually, you, you don't have to renormalize. You can note this, it's not at all as uh, for independent uh, random variable where you have the square root n. Here, you don't have to renormalize at all. And it converges to a Gaussian random variable. And uh, this Gaussian random variable, Okay, this formula, uh, okay, that, that's a bit scary, but uh, first th there is a shift, which is um, okay, an integral. It depends on, uh, this depends on the potential, but okay, why am I writing this uh, awful the formula? It's just to show you that uh, V doesn't play any role here. That's already something uh, uh, nice. Uh, that's okay, it just depends on A and B. But otherwise, uh, this, uh, the, the, the variance does not depend on the potential. Okay, and uh, instead of this uh, ugly formula, what you should keep in mind is just that this quantity, if S and T uh, are close, um, then it behaves as a, a minus log of the distance between S and T. So actually, you can already see that there are logarithmic interactions uh, in this result. Okay, so this was the theorem by uh, Johansson in um, 98, which is about uh, beta ensembles, but uh, there are many, many uh, results of this type in uh, random matrix theory. So I'm gonna cite some of them. Um, there are, f there are also both results. Uh, this was for a smooth function f, so at smooth at scale one. But actually, you can take a function f, which is also smooth, but uh, which varies at a scale which is a mesoscopic scale, that is a scale n to the negative s, for s which is between zero and one. One is the microscopic scale. It's the one over n is the typical distance between particles. So if you take a function which varies at a scale which is polynomially larger than the distance between particles, then uh, that's fine. There are also many results known close to the one uh, I had written before. So, okay, just setting everyone. So that there are, there are uh, models where so compact groups or de determinantal point processes where there are really a lot of form, uh, many for formulas and uh, to prove this type of results. Um, for 1D log gas, there is the result by Johnson that I just uh, cited, and then there are uh, results for uh, mesoscopic fluctuations. And there are uh, similar results in, in two dimensions for uh, 2D log gas. So the first results are in the case beta equal two, which is uh, always easier. But then uh, this result, Lebe Serfati and uh, Bauer Schmidt uh, Bourgad Nikolaiyao are uh, for a more general uh, 2D log gas, and uh, also with uh, mesoscopic uh, fluctuations. And there are also uh, universality results for uh, Wigner matrices. Okay, um, so compared to this, our case is the case where the function f is uh, so either the real part of the log or the imaginary part of the log. 
uh, but for both of them, the uh, the function here is not smooth at all. And actually, if you just plug in this in the formula before, you see that the, the variance should be plus infinity. So why is it not uh, plus infinity? Actually, it means that we have to, to renormalize more. And how can you get the, the right order for sigma square f? You should keep in mind that uh, Okay, there, there is a singularity, but uh, below the scale one over n, there are no particles anymore. So you can just regularize f at the scale one over n. You plug in in uh, sigma square f, and you will get the true side, the true size for uh, sigma square f, which is uh, log n. Okay, so here the, the whole difficulty of dealing with the characteristic polynomial is that we have to deal with a function f, which is singular. OK, so let's present the, the result now. So with this in mind, we know that uh, we'll have to, to rescale by, the, by square root log n. OK, so let me just recall that uh, xn of e denotes my uh, characteristic polynomial, log characteristic polynomial centered uh, by the law of large numbers. And that in the bulk, we expect that the covariance is given by a minus log of the distance with a saturation at level 1 over n. So that's uh, exactly what we get in the bulk. If you take two points, so here it's written for the real part. If you take two points in the bulk, so at a distance kappa from, from the edge, um, they can depend on n and their, their distance uh, OK, the log of their distance divided by, by log n converged to alpha, or negative alpha. Then their uh, asymptotic uh, covariance will be this uh, alpha as soon as alpha uh, is uh, smaller than 1. And that's exactly the saturation effect, which is here. So OK, uh, you can convince yourself that this means uh, somehow the the same as this, once you divide by uh, uh, the field by square root log n, these two uh, things are, are the same. Okay, so that's what we, we get in the bulk. We have um, uh, so convergence at one point, convergence at several points with the, the logarithmic uh, correlations. We have the same result for the imaginary part, and also we show that the imaginary part is independent of the real part. Okay. So that's the result in the bulk. We have exactly uh, what we expect. And then close to the edge, there are some, uh, some issues, of course. So first, the, the behavior of the real part is not any more the same as the one of the imaginary part close to the edge. So I won't write a precise result, but for the real part, actually everything, uh, the, the, the behavior is just uh, as if you replace uh, the one over n here is the typical distance between particles in the bulk. And because close to the edge, the distance between particles is uh, larger and larger, you have to replace this one over n by the typical distance between particles where you are looking at. That's really, you can say that it's really the same behavior. It's just that this one over n does not make sense close to the edge because the distance between particles is larger and larger close to the edge. Uh, for the imaginary part, uh, it's a bit different. So the, the variance is really decreasing uh, when you close, get close to the edge. And it's up to zero, actually. When you're exactly at the edge, the limiting variance for, for the, the imaginary part is just zero. So it means that there is no quotient behavior anymore. And that's what we expect, actually, because... Michel, I have a question here. Yes. Uh, in the bulk for the imaginary part, the result that 1 over square root log n is uh, Gaussian for the number of eigenvalues in an interval was already known, right? Uh,
Okay, do, do, do you mean that uh, the fluctuations of the, the fact that uh, the fluctuation of each particle has uh, around its position, if of other square roots log n over n? No, ju just the fact that the linear statistics, when the function is an indicator, at least for GOE, the fact that this is. Uh, yes, for GOE it was known. Yes, for GOE, GOE, uh, yes. Okay. But not, not, for, uh, not for general beta ensembles. Yeah, but then, then comes the question. Even for GOE, is it understood what is supposed to happen for the this number of eigenvalue in the small interval near the edge? Is that known? Uh, yes, yes, oh. it is. So I will comment a bit more on the known results afterwards. But uh, for the imaginary part, it was known uh, even close to the edge for GOE and GOE GSE. Yeah. Uh, for the real part, not everything was known even for this. Uh, simple models. Um, okay, so yeah, the variance is smaller. So why is it exactly zero at the edge? Uh, because, okay, I mentioned the, the, the imaginary part really tells you about position, the fluctuation of a particle around its position. And we know that at the edge, it's a tracy rhythm, the distribution. It's not at all a Gaussian distribution. So we cannot expect a Gaussian distribution. It, it's also that just the fluctuations are uh, uh, at a smaller scale and just so that's why we just see zero in the variance and that's we, we see nothing actually with, with our result exactly at the edge for the imaginary part. We just see nothing. Uh, correlations are also weaker for, for the imaginary part. Um, so actually you, you will see correlations only if your two particles are really close to each other, so closer than the distance to the edge. Uh, otherwise, so that, uh, otherwise, it will be completely decorrelated. So there are really different behaviors for, at the edge for the real part and the imaginary part. OK, uh, questions about uh, the results? So there's one in the chat, I think. Oh, uh, can you read it for me? Does the mesoscopic scale consideration apply to both the imaginary and real parts jointly or to each part separately? Um, okay, I'm not sure to understand the question. If it's about the mesoscopic, uh, so when I was talking about mesoscopic uh, uh, fluctuations, that was for uh, uh, okay, any you take any smooth function and you instead of uh, taking directly as it is, you, you rescale it so that uh, it fluctuates now on, on the scale, on the scale which is between uh, one, one over n and one. And, uh, but it has to be smooth. So it, it does not uh, apply. So we are outside of the mesoscopic uh, uh, case here. Because the function is really singular at, uh, at all scales. Okay. I don't know if it answers the question. Um, okay, so uh, this is uh, what I was talking about just uh, uh, before we, with Jao. That's the position of particles, fluctuation of the positions of particles. So the imaginary part of the logarithm of the characteristic polynomial, it's this counting uh, function particle. So if you denote by gamma k the classical location of the case particles, so it's the case uh, quantile of the, the equilibrium measure. Then lambda k uh, fluctuates around the position gamma k. And uh, the fluctuation, so there are, there are some scalings, and there is this square root log n over n. So typically in the bulk, the fluctuations of r of order square root log n over n. And then there are uh, the fluctuations are uh, larger and larger when you get close to the edge. And this is due to the fact that the, Density here is going to zero when you go close to the edge. Okay, so we actually that's a co completely direct uh, result that this uh, quantity satisfies exactly the same central limit theorem as this quantity. So we have uh, all the same uh, behavior, uh, multiple points, correlations, and so on. Okay. Um, so now let, let me dis discuss the. I'm, sure, I'm sorry, I have yes. another question. Yes. If you may, if I may, 
why is it that these two things are independent? Uh, oh, the real part and the imaginary part. That's your your question. Yeah. Um, the both are, you know, if you fix an E, they both talk about the eigenvalues near E. So why are they independent? Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I have an easy argument for that. So first, they are not uh, completely independent, if you want. So, uh, for example, if you're taking the, the if you're looking at the Gaussian multiplicative for, for both this uh, this uh, uh, field for the two fields, you exponential bo both fields at the same time. Let's say, then they are not independent. They, the, there are some correlations that affect. Here is just that we are looking, if you want, at a very weak. Uh, regime, which is the one where really uh, the, only the order log n. And at this order, they are independent, but they are not completely independent, actually, they are still. So, um, OK, I, I have no good answer for, for your question, sorry. <laughs> uh, OK, for me, the fact that the two behaviors here are, are uh, for example, uh, uh, really different is uh, also that uh, the real part, it's a, a symmetric singularity, the log of the absolute value. The imaginary part, it's a, a non-symmetric, uh, so let's say an odd uh, singularity. And so for the imaginary part, uh, really the, the fact that it's a further log n comes from the fact that you, you have interactions between both sides of the singularity. For the real part, uh, you can have uh, interaction only on one side from particles on one side of the singularity. That's why you still have a, a large behavior at the edge. Instead for the imaginary part at the edge, you really have one side of the singularity where there is nothing and the other side where there is everything. And so you see no fluctuations at all. So something that explains the difference in behavior, but not the independence. Okay. Um, so yeah, that, that's it for the, the location of particles. Uh, so now the, the known results. So there are many, uh, many known results, and especially for uh, uh, integrable models. So typically, when beta is equal to two, you have determinantal processes. Um, and also, when beta is equal to one or four, you can relate them to the case beta equal two, or still relate them to some uh, determinant calculations. Um, so typically for the uh, random unitary matrix, uh, this uh, result was known so first by uh, Hughes, Keating, O'Connell, and more with uh, exactly a, so setting close to, to our setting by uh, uh, Paul Bourgade. Uh, for GUE, uh, it was proved for uh, by Gustafsson for the imaginary part, and by uh, Krasovsky for the real parts, but only at uh, some uh, fixed points, so you don't really see the, correlate, the log correlations here. And then uh, for GOE and GSE, the, it was known for the imaginary part. Right? Oh. So that was your, your previous question, yeah. Um, for, um, actually for these models, there are even convergence to the Gaussian multiplicatives that are known, Gaussian multiplicative chaos. And this is uh, typically much stronger. I mean, you, you, need, uh, you need better estimates to prove uh, such a convergence. And um, OK, that's why uh, for now this uh, convergence is really uh, only proof for uh, integrable models. So for uh, the first one was for a random unitary matrix, but uh, also GUE, uh, other compact uh, classical compact groups, and uh, very recently, GOE and uh, GSE. Okay. So on, on one side, there, there are these uh, integrable models where uh, actually much more than what we're doing now uh, is known. And uh, on the other side are uh, the general models where uh, less is known. So one uh, famous general model is the, the one uh, just Wigner matrices. So such a result uh, was proved by Tao and Wu 
uh, but with uh, only for a Wigner matrix which has a four moment matching for all uh, Wigner matrices, so with two moment matching, it was proved by uh, uh, Paul Bourget and uh, Krishna. Uh, then there are also results for uh, circular beta ensembles, uh, okay, which are not exactly the same as the one uh, cited here. This one. In, it's still in some mesoscopic scale, but very close to microscopic. And uh, this one, it's uh, they prove a link with the Gaussian multiplicative chaos, but which is quite different from what we are doing here. So the two the two papers which are really related to what we are uh, doing here. So there are two uh, papers where they deal with Gaussian beta ensembles, uh, and they prove the a CLT for the characteristic polynomial. So to here, there are two papers by uh, Lambert and Paquette in 2020, where they prove the convergence of the characteristic polynomial either uh, in the bulk, but a bit above the, the like, let's say, for a regularized version of the log. And uh, they prove it exactly the, at the edge. For the real part of the log, they prove the CLT at the edge. And then there is a result uh, uh, a uh, paper by uh, Augerie, Butez, and Daytoni, uh, where they proved the CLT at one point in the bulk. Um, and uh, okay, both these papers, the method is that Gaussian beta ensemble, I said at the very beginning that they have a representation as a tree diagonal matrix. And you can use this to write a recursion for the characteristic polynomial. And uh, okay, they just study this recursion, that's uh, not an easy task at all. And uh, they study this uh, recursion to prove the, the central limit theorem for the characteristic polynomial. Okay. And that's why uh, th in this paper, the result applies to more uh, general models uh, than the one, just they have to ha have this uh, tree diagonal structure. Okay, uh, on the other hand, our method has uh, uh, nothing to do with uh, with this uh, recursion. Instead, we use loop equations. So loop equations have uh, uh, been used uh, for a while to prove, uh, uh, for example, the linear statistic, CLT for linear statistic. The proof by Johansson was uh, using uh, loop equations. But uh, that's the first time that okay, we are able to prove a central limit theorem, even for a singular linear statistic using only uh, loop equations. And also, we, so we deal with general potential V, not only Gaussian beta ensembles. And it's not by comparison. So often, uh, the result for general potential can be obtained by uh, doing a comparison with uh, the Gaussian case. Here, that's not what we are doing. We are just, it's a direct proof using loop equations for any potential V. So now, of course, uh, I'm going to talk uh, about the proof. And the main tool in the proof is um, an optimal local law. So first, I'm going to present this optimal local law and then uh, comment the proof. Okay. Do you have questions, right? So OK, the local law. What is a local law? Uh, a local law is uh, con uh, you look at the Stilges transform of the empirical measure, so it's this quantity, and this is the Stilges transform of the equilibrium measure. The law of large numbers tells you that if you look at a fixed point z, then uh, this quantity converges to this quantity. But the local law is the fact of proving that uh, this is true even if you are looking at the point z, which is a uh, closer and closer to the axis when n goes to infinity. So at uh, the, the imaginary part eta of the point z uh, goes to zero as n goes to infinity. And what you can uh, optimally hope is that uh, the, this difference should be of order one over n eta. Um, so just a picture to to show this. So here I take a Gaussian beta ensemble with n equal to 500. If eta is equal to n to the minus one quarter, 
uh, both cu curves are really close. And if I reduce eta progressively, you see that the, the difference is larger and larger. So this is eta, which is negative three quarter. And in the end, when eta is equal to one over n, fluctuations are of order one. So it means of, of the same order as the quantity which has R here. So you have no convergence at all. Because at scale one over n, really, uh, uh, you really see the, the, the fact that uh, positions of particles are discrete in the uh, empirical situation. OK, so that's what we want to prove. So first, what was known before, um, I, uh, there is a result by Bogard erdoshan yao which says that S um, minus the M equilibrium behaves as 1 over n eta times n to the epsilon. So that there is this n to the epsilon uh, error. Uh, and this holds with overwhelming probability. Okay. There is another uh, related local law with, uh, by uh, Soso and Mo. Uh, our results mainly get, get rid of this n to the epsilon. That's the idea. We really need an optimal local law, so we don't want this n to the epsilon. So this is the result. There is a small region like this one. So small beta and uh, this trapezoid region. If you take any point z in this region uniformly, you can look at any moment of s minus m equilibrium. And this is bounded by a constant depending on q divided by n eta to the q. So okay, that's what we call the optimal uh, local law. Um, so just a few comments. First, OK, here we can say why this uh, trapezoid region. Uh, we can prove it also outside of the trapezoid region. Just the constant is not uh, as good. Um, this proving such a local law implies the rigidity. So, okay, it's not completely uh, direct, but you can de uh, deduce the rigidity for particles at the scales log n over n uh, using this uh, local law. Um, so, it provides a, an alternative proof because we don't use the previous rigidity, which was uh, at scale n epsilon to the n over n. Um, uh, we don't use it in our proof, so it provides an alternative proof uh, of this uh, rigidity. And uh, okay, such an optimal local law was known in another context uh, for Wigner matrices uh, before. Okay. Questions about this? Okay, so how do we prove uh, this? Uh, so I will just uh, present a sketch of the proof in the case of Gaussian beta ensembles, so because it's a bit simpler. Um, so go for Gaussian beta ensembles, uh, the M equilibrium, the Stirgis transform, it's the Stirgis transform of the semi cephal distribution, it's an explicit function, actually. It sat uh, it's, uh, satisfies the following equation. So M squared plus ZM plus one is equal to zero. And so what we're gonna prove Instead of proving uh, directly that S is close to M, we prove that uh, S is uh, almost satisfying this equation. So S squared plus ZS plus one is small. And by small, I mean all moments uh, are sufficiently small. Okay, and then we'll be able to bound S minus M equilibrium in terms of, of this polynomial. And that's where, okay, that this is really true in the trapezoid region, and that's where the trapezoid region comes from. Um, so, okay, how do we prove that uh, this quantity is small? For that, we use uh, loop equations. Okay, so uh, what are loop equations? Loop equations are uh, exact equations for uh, moments here of the steel just transform, but it could be other quantities. Um, that are obtained by integration by part. So, okay, they can be found in many different forms, in many different papers. Here I'm putting, this is a physics paper. And in math, the, the loop equations at all order have uh, been first uh, used by Borough and Lyonnais. 
first loop equations for uh, cumulants, and here we are using loop equations for moments. So the first loop equation is this one. So, okay, how do you prove this? It's just really you, you see the expectation of S prime and you, you see this as a, a, a derivative of something, and then you do an integration by part and you integrate uh, this and you derive the Hamiltonian instead. And you get an equation. That's really uh, okay. Okay. not, not uh, necessarily easy, but uh, uh, there, there is nothing uh, uh, special in, in this calculation. Okay, this first loop equation, you, you recognize that we have our polynomial here. The one we want to prove is, is small. And we have something else on the other side. And you can already see that uh, this quantity here typically. Uh, okay. You can trust me on this. This quantity, we expect it to be of order one over eta. So you see that we already have, uh, okay, of course, there are no absolute values, so it's not really a bound here. It, it says nothing, but we just say that we can expect that the, this polynomial here should be of order one over eta. Okay, then there are, uh, we, we need uh, uh, loop equations at uh, involving many, many moments, so all types of moments. And uh, so here is the general loop equation. Uh, so we take new variables, z1 to zn, which are uh, spectator variables, and you write exactly the same thing, but so you add this in the moment. And you see that, okay, this term, okay, it corresponds to this one. Then this one, it's exactly the same as this one. But now you have another term. Um, OK, uh, whatever it is, it's still involving almost all the product of the S to S of the, the ZI. So this product is uh, uh, almost intact when you write the, the loop uh, equation. So what is the, the idea? We just take all the ZIs to be either z or z bar. So we get uh, some, some uh, any power of uh, s of z and any power of s of z bar. And if we do that, um, we can combine all these loop equations to recreate the polynomial here. We want to write everything in terms of this polynomial, not in terms of s, but in terms of this polynomial. So this was an idea already used by Lee and Schnelli. And this is what it's uh, uh, giving. So that's, uh, yeah, again, that's the same thing. That's the idea by uh, uh, Lee and Schnelli to combine these loop equations in order to write everything in terms of this polynomial. So here I'm not writing the dependence in Z anymore. Everything is uh, S of Z. Uh, I have the power two to the Q, uh, 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 the power two Q of this polynomial in absolute value expressed in terms of this uh, ugly thing. But what matters here is that we have, each time we have, okay, some, uh, not actually it's uh, some nice quantities. Uh, they're not necessarily looking nice, but what really matters is that we have the, mom the two Q moment here. And here we always have a two Q minus one or two Q minus two moments. So we have uh, an expression of the 2q moment of our quantity in terms of smaller moments. So because of that, we can uh, extract from this. So I'm, okay, here I'm going a bit fast, but really uh, that's just, uh, okay, we apply uh, Young inequality to this, and then we just have to be convinced that all these things that are in black here can be bound uh, easily. Uh, and you get that this quantity has to be smaller than uh, this constant to the q over n eta to the two q. Okay, and then that's it. Actually, that's uh, at, at least in the bulk, uh, this is uh, exactly the same as in uh, this. Okay, so um, really sketchy uh, uh, about this, but uh, this is the idea. Take all the loop equations, combine them, uh, and uh, you can combine them in many ways. Actually, and get uh, really you can always express any quantity you want here, uh, any polynomial in S, you will be able to express it in terms of, uh, of related uh, powers of the, this polynomial. 
Okay, so that's the, the idea of the proof of the local list. Okay. Um, so now uh, let's move to the central limit theorem. Um, so, okay, we want to prove the central limit theorem for this quantity. Here I'm looking only, let's say, at one point. Um, I rescale by one over a square root log n, and I want this to converge to a Gaussian random variable. The first step for, in this proof, so I said that uh, if you um, want the heuristic of usual linear statistic uh, CLT to be true, you have to regularize the function at scale one over n. See, that's more or less what we are doing. We are smoothing the log, and in order to smooth the log, we replace this uh, logarithm by the logarithm of e plus i eta. And by doing this, this makes the log slightly more smooth. Actually. And eta is not one over n, but uh, okay, slightly more than one over n. This doesn't really matter exactly what it is, but it has to be more than one over n. Actually. Okay, so that's the first step. We, we smooth the log, we say, okay, the small scales uh, do not matter. So how do we prove this? Uh, so this is exactly saying that we can uh, replace the log by its the smooth version of the log. How do we prove this? Uh, first, we need the optimal local load that I just mentioned. Um, and also, there is another uh, thing that we need. We need to know that up to scale one over n, if you take a small uh, interval, it's uh, very likely that uh, there is uh, no particle in it. So the expected number of particles in a sub-microscopic interval uh, uh, tends to zero. So uh, the proof of this fact relies first we need the optimal local law as a kind of input, but then we use the invariance with the Okay, we have a measure for, for the particles. And if you shift it a little bit uh, by some uh, uh, very small function to the, on some microscopic uh, distances, you just say that the, the whole density of the system does not vary so much. So there cannot be many particles at the same, in the small, same small interval. They have to, there, there is no reason that particles are here and not uh, just in the interval which is next to it. That's really the idea. And this relies uh, on the fact that we have a density for the, for the particles positions. Okay, so that's the first step. We, we smooth the log. Uh, so now we have to prove a central limit theorem for this quantity. Well, now F is the smooth log. So um, now the proof for this, it's really uh, inspired from the one from of Johansson. So Johansson was the one who proved the, the central limit theorem for linear statistics, smooth linear statistics. And uh, here we are using the, say the same method, just, uh, okay, there is one difference, uh, so, which has already been used by Bogad et Xiaoyin, which is to look at the characteristic function. Gramson was looking at the Laplace transform. Uh, but that's the same idea. So what's the idea? Uh, we have this quantity. We want to prove a, a central limit theorem. So we look at the characteristic function. Uh, then we do a change of measure. Instead of uh, working under the measure P, we will work under the measure p theta, where p theta is um, um, the, the previous measure tilted by uh, exponential uh, i theta sn of f. So that's uh, we we look at the effect of a tilt on the uh, on the potential actually uh, by the quantity we are interested. Okay, this is not a priority measure anymore; it's a complex measure, but okay. Uh, then what we really want to find is z prime of theta. Z prime of theta, uh, the good thing is that 
you can write it as so as the x i times this theta times the expectation of s n of f. And why is it better? Um, this is now just the expectation of a linear statistic, the expectation of a sum, and it's of a nicer than the expectation of the exponential of a sum. So, okay, we are working on a modified measure, but the quantity we have to estimate is simpler. That's really it. Okay, and uh, now how do we uh, estimate this quantity? Uh, okay, the idea is to use the uh, Helfer's just some formula. So this is the formula which allows us to write any function f like this as uh, an integral over the complex plane of another function g uh, defined in, in terms of, of f times one over x minus w integrated against w. So, okay, that's just a pure uh, uh, complex analysis result. But uh, the, the thing that matters here is that we get one over x minus w. So when we take the expectation of this quantity and we use the, this formula, we will get the Silge's transform that will appear. So we can write the expectation of any function, linear statistic of, with any function in terms of the linear, the Silge's transform, which is much better. So now we, we, we estimate this. And for this, we use uh, loop equations again. Uh, but now loop equations under this new measure. So under this new measure, this looks pretty much like the uh, loop equation. That's exactly the loop equation that we had before. But now there is an additional term due to the fact that we, we tilted the measure by some uh, factor. So there is a new term in the, the loop equation. And uh, we take as input our local law to estimate the size of each uh, element in this, uh, in this uh, loop equation. And so we are able to prove that uh, so we get a precise estimate for this quantity, the expectation under the tilted measure of S minus M equilibrium uh, in terms of uh, deterministic quantities here, plus error terms. Then you just plug in, you compute everything. It means if you can compute, estimate this, you can estimate this, you can estimate z prime over z theta, so you can estimate z theta. And that's it. Okay. So I stop here. Okay. I'm time. So thank you for your attention. Yeah. Let's thank Michel. 13.30. So questions? Maybe I'll ask you, can you do these particle systems in two dimensions rather than on the real line? Or is it? Uh, okay. Uh, or do you know? <laughs> so, okay, well, rather the, okay, the, the main tool here and everything is the, the Stiges transform. And you, you, okay, you don't have at all the same properties for the Stiges transform in uh, dimension two. And so, okay, most techniques uh, cannot work in dimension two. Really, uh, that's, uh, I would say that's a much harder problem in dimension two. Okay. No other questions? Yes, one here. Oh, yeah. uh, Michel again. So I, I tried to follow in your, what you were doing, trying to guess where this uh, independence or kind of independence would come, come in, but you didn't allude to that. So in fact, your proof here is entirely about just fluctuations of linear statistics when the function is not completely smooth. Uh, yes, exactly. That's, uh, that's not the, the proof here is not specific to the log actually. No, it's not, not specific so much. To, to the indicator. Not so problem. much, let's say. <laughs> so, I that I, I see. <laughs> but so, so what would produce the fact when you that when you take two linear statistics at the in, in the in the limit to become independent? Okay, so what do we take as a function? We actually we don't take this, we take a, a 
but okay, let, let's take this. This is the complex log. So okay, let, let's just take this one. You can do the whole proof. You get a CLT. We get sigma square of f as the variance in the end. So the same formula as before actually is true with this regularized version as the variance. And that's only when we compute what is uh, the value of, uh, we estimate sigma square of f uh, for the, this particular function. Uh, and we see that actually the real part and the imaginary part are, are not correlated. That's really at the very end. Actually, we prove, if you want, we, we, we prove, uh, we prove uh, Johnson's results for any function f, which is uh, varying uh, once it has been regularized a bit more than one over n, we can prove this result. And then it's just that when we estimate this quantity, uh, the real part and the imaginary part are independent. Actually, they are not completely, they, they are interactions, but not of order log n. That's really the thing that, that's also related to what I said before. The, the, in this sigma square of f, there will be interaction between the real part and the imaginary part of order uh, one, but the main term is of order log n. And at this, for the order of term of order log n, there are no interactions, no correlations. Okay, there, there is maybe a good reason for that that I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> This is what I was hoping you would tell me. But, uh. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. I, I, I'll try to think a bit more about this and I'll send you my, <laughs> my answer to your question. <laughs> so um, the, uh, the singularity of the log is pretty, pretty mild, um, but does your method work for something worse? I mean, could, could it be anything that's integrable under the big measure? No. I would say no. <laughs> uh, mm. Okay, but then this, all the scales are really different. So if you take f, which varies. So here, uh, in the end, we have this for the log n. Uh, if you take a function f, which is not the, the log, but something varying, uh, this uh, worse singularity, uh, then uh, just the scales are not the same. So, okay. Uh, um, I'm not able to, to guess right now if the, the error term that we, so the, the error term will be worse, of course, but the thing is that because uh, we are renormalizing more, maybe they are still uh, negligible, but uh, okay, I've not done this uh, calculation, so I cannot just uh, tell you right now. Okay. But, uh, yeah, the, 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 scale, the scaling of the CLT would, would be different if uh, the, okay. yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, but I, uh, yeah, I think uh, there can be some issues. <laughs> oh, I have a question on slide six. I was wondering um, if there is any significance in the pattern of the imaginary portion, imaginary part and the uh, real part. And uh, I think it's the previous slide, the slide five, I think, where you have the both uh, um, graphs. Oh, yeah. Um, that one, yes, slide five. Uh, the patterns and shapes, let's say concavity and convexity or mutual exclusion of the patterns, do they have any significance when you actually uh, apply the correlation? And uh, what is the interpretation from mathematical point of view, the physical point of view, physics point of view? So, okay, first on uh, the shape. So we, we have seen that uh, both are independent at least uh, in the main scale. So this one and this one, okay, they can do a bit whatever they want uh, independently. Um, they're not restricted in a, in a, they're not. No, 
know the, the uh, so the, the, the correlation we see it. I mean, if it was completely, um, you can see that there are some correlations. Sometimes it stays a bit up, a bit down, and. Uh, and Then okay, I'm not uh, able to recognize uh, directly on the picture if the correlation if the correlations are logarithmic or not. But, uh, okay. yeah. <laughs> or if there is a relative maximum on one for one, or if you actually try to interpolate it, if you find a maximum or a minimum, a relative maximum on each side, and you look at them, what is the significance, if any? If not, there is none. I mean, just. Uh, I guess every problem would have a particular interpretation then. Every case, every scenario. So do you mean, what does the maximum mean, for example, that's what you mean? Right, I mean, if you got here, let's say on the, if I look at the real part, it looks like a, it's a growing function, and then it, if I try to interpolate it, and then at the end it goes down, if I look at the imaginary part, it looks like a kind of somewhat convex, if I put a line about, no, that's just, I think that's just, uh, right. so okay, that's pattern. completely random. <laughs> no, no, that it's not, uh, no restriction, no, okay, particular. okay, no, no, the, that was the, the, the form could be could completely different here. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think let's thank uh, Michelle again for the great talk. Thank you, Guillaume. Oh, thanks for the talk. I'll stop the recording.